Please be seated as we hear the last of the Ten Commandments. We've been going through these this summer, uh, and we come to the final one today, and I know many of you are glad that there weren't 20 commandments. Uh, let's hear the last one. From Exodus 20, And God spoke all these words, saying, You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So let's be honest. On a scale of 1 to 10, if it's for the Ten Commandments, where do you put this commandment? 1 being the most important, 10 being, it's important, but we can still mess it up if, if we have to. It'll be okay. Most people would put this one, number 10. Because after all, I mean, we, we, you, you, you compare it to killing or stealing or, 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 or lying or adultery or blasphemy, the sin of covetousness seems relatively minor. Centuries ago, St. Francis de, de Sales uh, noted that over the course of his ministry, that, that multitudes of people had come to him to confess all kinds of deeds, many of a very glaring nature, sins of passion, sins, sins of violence, uh, sins of betrayal, sins of murder. But in all of his long life, he never had a single person come to him to confess coveting. I haven't either. Now, maybe that's because most of us don't like to think of ourselves as being greedy or envious. I think it's more because even if we are, we don't believe that these character faults are nearly so serious as the others. After all, everybody is jealous of somebody else at some time, aren't they? You will not find a United Methodist minister on this planet who has not been jealous of another pastor at some time. But it's not just preachers. The famous French artist Degas, he was known for his, his ballerinas. He, he was jealous of his friend and artistic competitor, Edouard Manet. They met when Degas was 27 and, and Manet was 30. Um, they became friends, uh, but then they became competitors. And Degas said of Manet, everything he does, he always hits it off straight away, while I take endless pains and I never get it right. Sound familiar? You know, the odd thing but that was, was that actually Manet was just as jealous of Degas. <laughs> Degas even painted Manet and his wife once. But later on, Manet got so angry, either at Degas or maybe at his wife, he slashed the portrait. <laughs> he cut her right in half. It's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? But when it comes to wanting the gifts and talents of other people, everybody wants something, which is perhaps why the sin of concupiscence, that's your word for the day, concupiscence, try to work it into the dinner conversation. Sin of concupiscence or coveting is placed among the gravest and grossest sins in the scripture. Not only did Jesus warn us about it, Luke 12, he said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. St. Paul likewise went on to list it alongside immorality and impurity as actions which are improper for God's holy people in Ephesians 5. He told us greed is the same as idolatry and should be put to death along with all our other evil desires, Colossians 3. Greed is even listed among the behaviors in Corinthians 6 which can prevent us from inheriting the kingdom of heaven. Greed can now, to be sure, this term can be used in a positive sense. The word hamad in Hebrew uh, means simply to take pleasure in or delight in something else, even to have an intense love or even a desire or lust for an object or a person. The psalmist uses it positively in the psalm in, when he says that the word of God is more to be desired than much fine gold, sweeter than the honey in a honeycomb. St. Paul similarly told the Corinthians they should earnestly desire or covet the greater gifts of God's spirit. But on the whole, when we stop and look at the Bible, the examples of those who were covetous are not very encouraging ones. 
Joshua 7, for example, there's a story of Achan. This is not Clay Achan. He's a, he's a different idol. A Hebrew named Achan, whose greed was, res was responsible for the defeat of the whole Israelite army at a Canaanite town called Ai. Now, bear in mind that the Israelites had already defeated Jericho. The walls had come a-tumbling down, and that was a much bigger city, a much stronger fortification. Ai was this little podunk town just down the road from it, and there the Israelites were defeated. Why? Because Achan had, had acted unfaithfully with regard to the spoils of war. The Israelites had been told to destroy the possessions of those whose lands they conquered. But when Achan saw a beautiful robe from Babylonia and 200 shekels of silver and gold, he coveted them and he hid them in the ground inside of his tent. That's why the Israelites couldn't stand against their enemies until Achan's sin was uncovered and he was punished. Likewise, 1 Kings 21 records for us the account of King Ahab. Ahab, whose desire to have the garden of, of his neighbor Naboth led him at the prompting of his evil wife Jezebel to actually frame Naboth for blasphemy and after he was killed to then take that vineyard for his own. We'll read on a little bit in the book and you'll see that there too God was not to, to, to be mocked. In the New Testament, there's the example of two early members of the church, Ananias and Sapphira. They had great names. God is gracious and beautiful. They didn't live up to them. That's why you will never find a St. Ananias Methodist church anywhere. Uh, Ananias sold a piece of property in order to give the monies to the church. But when it came time to do so, with his wife's full knowledge, they decided they would keep part of the money for themselves instead. Now that could have been okay. Only when it came to the apostles, they lied about it. They told them this was the entire amount they probably asked for a tax receipt for the fully depreciated value of the gift. But Peter told them, you're not just lying to men, you're not just lying to, to even the IRS, the, the Israelite Revenue Service. You're lying to God at this point. And both of them actually died because of their sinful actions. Is it any wonder that the book of Acts says great fear came upon the church at that time? Great fear would come upon this church if that happened here too. Ananias and Sapphira found out the hard way as Achan and Ahab and also Jezebel had that greed and covetousness are genuinely offensive sins, not just to other people. They're offensive to God himself. And why? Because at the root of any inordinate desire to have what we don't have is a rejection of what we do have which is God himself. That's why Hebrews 13, 5 puts it in really forthright terms. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Or as I think I just heard, trust and never doubt. Jesus will surely bring you out. He never failed you yet. So I'm not suggesting that it's wrong to try and make a profit or do well in your business dealings, whatever they, th th those may be. Not at all. Without some pursuit of gain, the world of commerce could not conduct itself. Nothing would really work in the economy. It's one of the paradoxes of the Christian faith, in fact, that, that, the, that the more someone takes their faith seriously and begins to reflect the virtues that mark a true follower of Christ, the more successful and even prosperous that person's going to become. The early Methodists, for instance, quite literally pulled themselves out from the lowest working class in, uh, of all of England in the 1700s to the middle and the upper class, purely because when they got saved, they also discovered a good work ethic in their lives. John Wesley's advice to his converts thus was not to prevent them from being frugal and diligent. It was to earn all you can, save all you can, and then give all you can. I think in this day of Chick-fil-A, if you heard the parody on yesterday about Chick-fil-A, about a man who wants Chick-fil-A and then realizes it's the wrong day. 
Chick-fil-A. What a dirty, rotten trick to play. <laughs> now I'll have to settle for Subway. <laughs> Chick-fil-A stays closed on Sunday. So does Hobby Lobby. Do you know neither one of them has lost any business, any revenue? They're both doing great. They're honoring God's word. There's a line between diligence and business and pure greediness is for gain, though. It's barely as broad as a razor's edge, which may account for why it seems so many have crossed over it. Someone once said that covetousness is a snake that can enter at the smallest hole. Some folks open the door wide open for it. When corporate heads of companies can make literally thousands of times as much money as their workers do. The sin of covetousness has clearly been broached. In turn, we've created a culture of money in our society in which it is no longer just thriftiness or having good business sense in which it is valued. For many, it is now purely and simply about being loaded. Only here's the irony of it all. When it comes down to it, it is impossible to satisfy the greedy. James Atlas tells of being at a party in New York when another writer, one who had done very well financially, said to him, you never have enough. That's the thing about money. And then he said, I've had people with $10 million tell me that they feel poor. And in certain circles of New York City, at least in the 10021 zip code, they are poor. Because in that neighborhood, people with only $10 million are known as the little rich. Here's the truly amazing thing about greed, though. It can come in either prosperity or adversity. No class of society is free from it. As some who are rich are proud. Some who are poor are prouder still. But when you give in to the greed need, when you give in to the coveting, when you give in to envy, you can never have enough. So before you know it, it begins to take over everything else. It's like the tragedy of Gollum or Smeagol in Lord of the Rings. When, when you first see him, it is, it is obvious that his obsession with the one ring, the ring that can rule all others, has already taken a gross toll on him. His appearance and his mannerisms are no longer human or even hobbit-like. They are like those of a grotesque figure indeed. And yet what Smeagol still wants more than anything else is that ring that has destroyed him. It is the precious, he says. And when Tolkien wrote that work, I think he intentionally used this very same idea of preciousness, which the Hebrew word for greed, hamad, would suggest. Those who fall into coveting no longer even have control. The thing they covet, the thing they desire, the thing they even lust for, controls them now. So what is the cure for the calamity of coveting? How can we beat back the greed in, the, in, our, in our lives? Let me suggest, first of all, the answer is not where some idealists have tried to place it over the years. It is not in a massive redistribution of wealth. John Perkins, a leader in creating Christian, Christian programs for the poor, once observed, even if we redistributed all the wealth evenly, within a couple of years, the rich will have it all back again. Following World War II, for instance, under the Marshall Plan, every citizen of Germany was given the exact same amount, the equivalent of $50. Within 10 years, 90% of the wealth of Germany was concentrated in the hands of 5% of the population. Being rich is not just having money. It's knowing how to get money. And the rich seem to know how to do that. On the other hand, those who have great resources have greater responsibilities. Thinking of Nazi Germany, uh, at the end of the classic film Schindler's List, the 1,200 Jews who had been rescued by the German businessman tell Oscar Schindler how thankful they are for the incredible risks which he took at great financial cost to himself, even every, every finnick he had to save them from the Nazi Holocaust. 
But as they come to express their gratitude, Schindler breaks into tears. And he says, I could have done so much more. They say, no, Herr Schindler, you, you did so much. But in a moving display of emotion, Schindler points to his automobile and says, see, see that car? I could have sold it and used the money to save other people. Tony Campola, coming on, on this scene, uh, asked, why is it that those rich people who have done more than we would expect of them are the ones who always say that they should have done more? Perhaps it is because they are conscious of having to give an account to a higher authority of what has been done with the resources that were placed in their hands. They and each of us will have to give an account. And if you have wealth this morning, great or small, don't worry about trying to justify it. Don't, don't, don't apologize for it. Just use it in ways that will bring God glory and will bring joy and life to other people. Luke 12, 48 tells us, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. Whether, whether rich or poor, you see, the real cure for coveting involves following the admonition of the rest of that verse from Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because as God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You see, the opposite of covetousness is simply contentment. And the place where we find our most contentment is purely in knowing this promise. Trust and never doubt. Jesus will surely bring you out. He never failed you yet. If you're standing on the promises then, so to speak, then, then whatever premise is that you may find yourself in, no matter what the circumstances of your life may be this morning, it won't, it won't really matter. Now I know most of us think <laughs> if we just had a little bit more money, just a little bit more, We'd be satisfied. Newsflash. We wouldn't. Because that's not, the, that's not the kind of contentment God has exhorted us to have. What the book says, be content with such things as you have. That means living life in the right tense and mood, for example. Not thinking of what we could or what we should or what we should have. Rather what we do have and are, have, have already been blessed with by God. It means taking a long view as well as short views and life. An attitude which says, in the words of the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, a century ago, whatever it is, in the end, it won't matter. We will soon laugh at this present little bit of vexation. And when we get to heaven, this great trial will seem very small. When I look from the hilltops of glory at my present dilemma, it will probably cause me to smile to think that I should have been so vexed and tormented by it. It means remembering our lives do not consist in the abundance of the things we possess, but in the treasures we store up for ourselves in heaven. See, there's a good reason why this commandment is the very last one of the ten, and that is because it bookends the first one. You shall have no other gods before me, do not covet. So let me ask you this morning, have you, been, have you been coveting that which you don't have? Maybe it's your neighbor's house or family. You know, the one that has the perfect family. Maybe it's your neighbor's trophy wife. His Isha, as Exodus 20, 17 says. Maybe it's your neighbor's servants or his animals, or his car, or his big screen TV, or, or her exciting job, or her beautiful looks and figure, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> what God may be asking you this morning is simply, what? Am I not enough? Am I not enough? 
It's okay to want some things. It's okay to try to better ourselves. But whenever we start to inordinately want what we don't have, we're also rejecting what we do have, which is God himself. <laughs> Promise to never forsake us or leave us. Titus 3 tells us that at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, slaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Sound like our culture today? But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Which means that in the end, it's not about the precious. It's about our precious Lord. So here again, that which God said so long ago, you shall not covet. Just, no. Just, no. No. You shall not covet. Could it be he is inviting us not to covet, but to come? To come and find our true contentment in him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Cap of these commandments.